When you introduce yourself for the first time, what is it that you tell people about yourself? Now, you'll usually tell people your name, but what you say after that will usually depend on the context of where or why you are meeting that person. For instance, if you're meeting somebody at a wedding, say, for the first time, you might tell them your relation to the bride or to the groom. But if you are meeting somebody at a business conference, you'll probably tell them what company you run or work for and what position in that company you hold. And crucially, what we decide to tell people in these situations will usually inform and frame the rest of the conversation that we have with them. It will also help that person that we're talking with understand more about where we, as a person, are coming from. Now, in the Bible, there is a moment recorded for us when God, for the first time, delivers his laws to the Israelite people for how they are to live. We know these today as the Ten Commandments. And whether you're able to repeat all ten word for word or whether you don't know them at all, chances are that you know at least that there are ten of them. And if you live in the Western world today and in many other countries around the world, the laws of your country will find their bases in these ten commandments. But did you know that prior to these ten commands, God also makes one key statement and that statement is an introduction. This is God introducing himself and just as what we choose to tell people about ourselves when we meet them for the first time sets the context for what we say next, so too does what God says about himself here. And what does God say? It's recorded for us in Exodus 20 verse 2. Let's read that. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And here, God is introducing himself for the very first time to the Israelites. Not so much to Moses, he'd already met him before, but God himself is introducing himself to his people, and this is what he chooses to say. He then goes on to relay his Ten Commandments to the Israelites, and if you need a refresher, here they are. He says, Have no other gods before me. Do not make images to worship. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honour your mother and your father. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness and do not covet. And what sets the context for these ten instructions is the statement that God makes about himself as he introduces himself to his people for the very first time. Without the statement, we will miss the intent of the commands. And it would be like trying to understand the intent of the Constitution of the United States without reading the introduction. The introduction to the Constitution sets the guiding principle for everything that follows. So if you really want to understand the aim of the Ten Commandments, you need to pay close attention to the way that God chooses to introduce himself to his people. So the question we need to ask is, what is God choosing to tell us when he makes this statement? about himself. The first thing we need to see is that this is God speaking. Exodus 20 verse 1 says, and God spoke all these words. God is giving these commandments, not Moses and not any other human authority. These commandments are divine decrees, not man-made code of conduct. Secondly, God is declaring that it was he who delivered the people from slavery. No human being did this, not even Moses. Therefore, those who are hearing this statement have an obligation to God. And what is that obligation? That they are to live by the Ten Commandments that follow. The statement God makes also asserts two other things. Number one, that morals, the standard for right and wrong, come from God and not from man. Therefore, morals transcend human opinion and are absolute and not relative. Or in other words, what is right and wrong does not change depending on our opinion. For example, it is always objectively wrong to murder someone even if the society around you encourages it or even celebrates it. And number two, that God wants us to treat one another in moral ways, i.e. God wants us to treat one another rightly and not wrongly. Notice that none of the Ten Commandments concern what people must do for God. 
Other religions of the time did stipulate this. Some of those religions required their gods to be fed. Others required sacrifices, even the sacrifices of children. But in the commandments that follow, God lays down not what we can do for him, but what we can do for ourselves and what we can do for each other. The thing we can do for God is to treat ourselves and others in a moral way, a way that aligns with God's definition of right and wrong. And finally, let's look at God's choice of statement about himself. Notice he chooses to say, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Why didn't he choose to say, I am the one who created the world, or I am the one who split the Red Sea in half, or I'm the one who breathed life into the very first man? Any of those others would have been accurate, and any of them would surely have been more impressive. Well, God's choice of declaration shows us the value he places on freedom and his abhorrence of slavery. God wants us to live free lives. Many people have viewed or do view the Ten Commandments as a set of rules designed to constrain, compel and control humans, to stop them from having freedom, to live the kind of life they want to live. But when God introduces himself to the Israelites for the first time, he introduces himself as the champion of freedom, as the enemy of slavery and bondage. And this is exactly who he is. And this is exactly what the Ten Commands that follow this introduction seek to do. You see, far from being a restrictive set of arbitrary rules, the commandments, if perfectly followed, are the blueprint for living a life of freedom which doesn't come from doing whatever you want, but from always doing the right thing. See, God hates slavery. He hates to see his people, you and me, enslaved, but left unchecked. Our natural position and inclination as people is to place ourselves into the slavery of immoral patterns of thought, behaviour and speech. And the Bible calls that sin. God loves people and God hates sin because sin enslaves people and God created people to live lives of freedom. And so when God introduces himself to his people for the very first time, he introduces himself as a God who drew them out of the place of slavery. He then delivers to them a blueprint for a life of freedom and takes them into a land where they were supposed to live out that life as an example to all of the people of the world around them. Unfortunately, to embrace that life of freedom that comes through the blueprint of these commands, The commands have to be kept perfectly. And not just on an outwardly superficial level, but on an inward heart level too. And everyone who has ever tried to follow these commands perfectly has failed because they just couldn't do it. However, as if to underscore his point when he said, I am the one who delivered you out of the house of slavery, God sent us somebody who could. Jesus Christ, God's own son, lived out God's commands perfectly. And through his perfect life and willingness to take our place on the cross, he now offers us a way back into God's perfect freedom. And this new way into God's perfect freedom isn't found by perfectly keeping God's law. It's found by accepting the free gift of salvation that God offers us through his son Jesus. And when we do that, God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit who lives within us and empowers us to live in a way that aligns with God's blueprint for freedom. Far from wanting to control you or seeking to restrain or spoil your fun, God's desire for you, for me and for all of humanity is to live a life of freedom that sees people flourish in perfect relationship with one another, the world around them and with If you've enjoyed this video, we'd really love you to head over to our website and connect with us. At Life Church, we've created The Journey, which is a great place to begin your journey with God or to find out more. We want to help you, resource you, encourage you and equip you so that you can discover who God created you to be. As well as that, you can find out more about everything we do on our Facebook and YouTube pages. We look forward to hearing from you.